Yes, we did hear you. Great. Yep. Okay. All, all good to start? I think so. Okay, I'm going to go for it. Well, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm going to share this. I'm realizing that it's very dark in here. probably doesn't help very much. But So thank you for the invitation to present this um, work that I've been doing on mixing mathematical modeling and qualitative research methods. This is something that I've been uh, attempting uh, through the years, and I hope that this will convince you that it's a, a valuable approach and uh, at least that you will find it interesting. So I will move straight into um, telling you a little bit about mathematical models of epidemics and in particular of HIV. Um, so mathematical models are simplified representations of reality and they're used to mostly better understand a phenomenon to test hypotheses uh, and evaluate uh, hypotheses and to make predictions of the future, and in particular to evaluate intervention impact in the future. And so I'm going to show you an example for each of these, um, for each of these uh, objectives of modeling, just to get you into, into it. And so a paper that I've always really liked uh, uh, by Stephen Goodrow and Matthew Golden uh, is um, biological and demographic causes of high HIV and sexually transmitted disease prevalence in men who have sex with men. And so this falls within the realm of understanding a phenomenon. And what they did with this paper is to uh, explain or to explore the very high prevalence of HIV that has been observed among uh, different communities of men who have sex with men uh, across settings. And so there had always been this idea that such high prevalence was simply due to very high risk behaviors, very high risk sexual behaviors among men who have sex with men. And um, what Goudreau and Golden did here is that they actually dissected uh, this, um, this assumption and they incorporated other hypotheses, including uh, other factors that contribute to uh, this high prevalence. And so they started by looking at role, uh, 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 sexual positioning, sorry, or sexu sexual role in, uh, uh, in in, in sex among men who have sex with men. And so the particularity about anal sex between men is that uh, sexual positioning can be versatile. So it can either be penetrative or it can be receptive. And that means that there is more efficient transmission because receptive uh, sex is more risky or there is a higher transmission probability during uh, receptive sex than during insertive sex. In heterosexual populations, this is 100% uh, polarized with uh, women uh, being receptive and men being penetrative, and this reduces transmission efficiency at the population level. And so what this uh, paper did was to look at how this uh, versatility in sexual positioning could affect uh, prevalence at the population level. And so you can see here scenario one, uh, I think it's possible to, to have a pointer, but uh, maybe not. I don't want to play around with this too much. Laser. Nope. Okay, I'm going to forget about that. Um, so Scenario one assumes that 100% of men are versatile, and you can see that prevalence reaches uh, about 20% uh, over time. In comparison, in scenario uh, two, they assume that uh, sexual role was identical as if it was heterosexual sex. So 50% of men were exclusively insertive and 50% of men were exclusively receptive. And you can see that endemic prevalence goes down to about half at 10%. Then they explored intermediate scenarios because of course, the sexual, uh, sexual positioning among a community of men who have sex with men can take uh, various various forms, and here they assume, for example, that 50% would be versatile versus 35% insertive and 15% um, receptive. And you can see that scenario three stands somewhere here in between scenario one and two. And so this uh, highlighted the very um, strong uh, effect of role versatility in uh, anal sex. And then what they did was to compare um, uh, the risk uh, 
among a heterosexual population. And so they assumed exactly the same patterns of behavior. So uh, given that it's a heterosexual population, 50% inserted, 50% versatile, the same distribution by activity or number of sexual partners, the same number of sexual partners in each activity group that you can see here, 111, 7.7, 7.7, etc., and the same number of acts per partner. And you can see that uh, in this population, uh, we don't even see an epidemic for scenario four. So basically, uh, the, the conditions are not sufficient to establish an epidemic among this heterosexual population. And that's because the risk of transmission through um, uh, vaginal sex is much lower than uh, through anal sex. And so basically these papers serve to demystify the idea that the high prevalence among men who have sex with men is just there due to high uh, sexual activity among men who have sex with men. Now I'll move on to the second objective of mathematical modeling, which can be described as testing a hypothesis. And so one of the um, important questions that have been tested with mathematical modeling is the reason behind the decline in prevalence observed in some very highly affected sub-Saharan African countries, such as Uganda and Zimbabwe. Um, and so in several of these countries, uh, in the mid 2000s, we observed a decline in prevalence. And um, there was a lot of excitement around this because it meant that it possibly was related to a decline in sexual behavior and therefore to the success of interventions uh, in terms of information about HIV risk and distribution of prevention methods to reduce this, um, uh, to reduce incidence of HIV and therefore prevalence a few years back. However, there was also debate around this issue because this drop in prevalence could simply be due to the natural course of the epidemic with um, saturation of the, the population at high risk and death from HIV uh, and well from AIDS of, of this section of the population that had high risk behaviors and therefore leading to a decline of prevalence as a result of a decline in, uh, uh, in, in people living with HIV. And so, as is uh, explained in the introduction of this paper, mathematical models are, precise, are a precise way of describing assumptions about the transmission dynamics of an infectious disease and can be used to generate predictions. It is possible to generate predictions of HIV prevalence with and without behavior change and test which predictions are consistent with observed patterns of prevalence. And so this is what Hallett et al. did in this study. They basically uh, gathered all of the data they had about behaviors among uh, the population in these countries, and they estimated the course of the epidemic without any behavior change with very conservative assumptions about uh, anything that could uh, lead to a reduction in prevalence. So anything that could lead to a reduction in prevalence, they uh, use the maximum parameter value for this uh, in order to be conservative in the analysis. And basically, in Zimbabwe, they showed that between 2002 and 2004, there had been a, a decrease in prevalence among several groups by age and by sex. And that in both cases, uh, the observed changes could not be reproduced through the natural evolution of the epidemic alone, but could be generated if the overall probability of infection was reduced by half in 2001. So you can see it here. Uh, this is a natural course of the epidemic and the confidence intervals around the data points. And you can see that uh, for, for this uh, data point here, even with very strict and conservative assumptions about the natural course of the epidemic, we could not have observed uh, this decline. And this is contrary to other um, uh, to what was, uh, what was observed, sorry, in other countries, uh, such as uh, urban Ethiopia, where actually we could uh, have observed this decline independently of uh, a, a change in behavior, which does not mean that there was not a change in behavior, but uh, the, the, th this cannot be proven through mathematical modeling. Finally, um, I'm going to tell you about an example in terms of using modeling to predict intervention impact. And I'm using here a paper from um, a few people in our, our division. So Andy Gies, who was here uh, a few years ago, and uh, Stephanie Stradley. And it was about the promise of methadone uh, to manage HIV and addiction in Kenya. 
So as you can see here, um, Kenya is the third sub-Saharan African country to introduce uh, opioid substitution treatments. And uh, the incorporation of harm reduction and the introduction of opioid substitution therapy constitutes a major departure in Kenyan drug policy, which used to be more conservative. And this could have a huge impact in terms of treating um, drug use disorders uh, in this country and other sub-Saharan African countries. So here they use mathematical modeling to estimate for the first time in an African setting uh, and in the context of a generalized epidemic, what would be the potential uh, HIV prevention impacts of actually scaling up OSD among people who inject drugs. And you can see here that when we assume different coverage uh, of, of OSD, so from 10%, 20%, and 40%, we see reductions in both incidence and prevalence over 5, 10, and 20 years. And so you can see, for example, that for the highest coverage, we could expect up to 20% reductions in incidence that would translate in uh, between 10 and 15% uh, decrease in prevalence over time. So that was just to give you a feel of the use of mathematical modeling. And now I'm going to try to show you how incorporating qualitative methods uh, in this context can be, uh, can be of use. So what for? So qualitative methods can be used to, one, inform mathematical model, model structure and parameterization, two, to complement or confirm mathematical model findings, and three, to contextualize mathematical model findings. And so here is the very simplified uh, diagram of the process uh, followed when doing modeling analysis. So starting by modeling the model structure, so how your population is divided, then modeling parameterization, so uh, attributing values to the different uh, behaviors that you're modeling, such as sexual behaviors, and then communities of MSM. I'm not implying that this sudden uh, influx of qualitative research was driven by the modeling paper. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, very few people read that paper. But basically, there was an acknowledgement in the HIV uh, community, research community, that sexual positioning was important in uh, both individual and population level transmission, and it was investigated in much more depth. And several findings uh, came out from these studies. And actually, there's a, a very good review where actually Laramie Smith is a co-author. Uh, and I should have provided the, um, the citation at the bottom, but I apologize about that. But basically, uh, there were a few main findings from uh, looking at all of these different papers together. For example, in, in societies that are more traditional and that have more traditional uh, gender roles, um, there was more segregation in terms of sexual positioning among MSM. So for example, in Mexico and Peru, where this has been studied in quite a bit of depth, it was shown that most men were either exclusively insertive or exclusively receptive, and that uh, a smaller proportion uh, had a versatile role. And th those were named either uh, modernos or internacionales. So as you can see, kind of more progressive, modern, fashionable kind of um, behaviors compared to the more traditional, uh, yeah, kind of segregation of roles. Um, this also, um, we also saw differences by race. So for example, this study of black gay men in Toronto showed that uh, black gay men were more likely to play the insertive role when they had sex with white men because they were perceived as, as being more um, uh, masculine and uh, bigger and tougher, and so they had to play the masculine role. But that when they were in uh, partnerships with other black gay men, they were more likely to take versatile roles. And this was also related to intimacy with these partners. And so when there was a relationship uh, behind that sexual interaction, uh, there was a higher likelihood of, of inverting roles. Um, and so, um, this is important in terms of modeling because um, it will um, 
it will drive certain dynamics of HIV transmission within the uh, Black MSM uh, community and between the MSM Black community and uh, white uh, communities of MSM. Uh, other studies, for example, show that uh, age was an important factor in determining this. So young men, uh, young gay men who were less experienced were more likely to take the receptive role uh, because um, they, yeah, because they were less experienced and they were in a way considered more fragile or more, more vulnerable. And as they aged and they gained confidence, it was more likely that they would also take the insertive role or completely uh, change to always being the insertive partner. So basically in this framework that was built around all of these uh, papers that are actually not only qualitative, but a, a big proportion of the, of the literature is uh, from qualitative research they found that um, this was mainly driven by masculine stereotypes, uh, by partner type, by age, by HIV status, and by race and ethnicity. And all of these findings are important in terms of informing the population structure in our mathematical models, as well as the parameterization of who uh, is having what type of uh, sex act with, uh, with whom. Um, finally, uh, in, no, not finally, this is just a second example. So in terms of testing a hypothesis, um, so going back to our Zimbabwe example of uh, was this reduction in prevalence driven by uh, a change in sexual behavior, this question has been uh, examined in thorough detail and there's about 20 papers about this just for Zimbabwe. But one of these papers is a qualitative research paper that looked at local perceptions of the forms, timings and causes of behavior change in response to the AIDS epidemic in Zimbabwe. And so what they did is that they did 16 focus group discussions with 200 men and women and 24 in-depth interviews with uh, key stakeholders. So mostly experts and managers involved in HIV response. And they also did a comprehensive desk review about HIV AIDS policy and programming. So mostly communication about risk of HIV uh, through campaigns and, and, other, and other means of communication. And they split the time of their interviews based on the information obtained from modeling and statistical analysis showing that there was a change in behavior uh, likely from uh, 1999 onwards. And so they asked people uh, if they could remember each period uh, and whether they thought sexual behavior change had happened in that period and why. And interestingly, they found that uh, exposure to relatives and close friends dying of AIDS leading to increased perceived HIV risk was a principal explanation for behavior change. So although there was an expectation that this behavior change was driven by all the communication and prevention uh, efforts um, around the epidemic, that it was mostly due to uh, perception of risk uh, from people dying around, around them. Uh, also, growing poverty um, reduced men's ability to afford multiple partners, uh, and this was related to um, the economic crisis that occurred in Zimbabwe uh, along, along those years. Um, and, uh, and this was also commonly cited as contributing to reductions in casual, commercial, and extramarital sex. And so HIV prevention programs were secondarily mentioned uh, to have contributed, but uh, people couldn't remember any specific messages or activities. However, it was also acknowledged that increases in condom use, uh, for example, could not have happened without the presence of these prevention programs. But I thought that this was a good example to show you how um, this qualitative uh, research uh, makes the, ma the, ma the mathematical modeling findings, sorry, um, richer because uh, while the mathematical modeling findings suggest a change in behavior, which is confirmed by the qualitative study, uh, it also brings a little bit more reality into why this happened uh, and, uh, and it finds a common ground in, in the debate of did this uh, change in behavior happen because of interventions or not. Finally, uh, for the prediction um, piece that I, I presented you, I actually hid half of the, uh, of the title when I, when I initially presented it to you. And actually this is 
to my knowledge, the only mixed methods mathematical modeling and qualitative study that is presented as such, where, where actually there is a parallel uh, modeling and qualitative study being presented in a single paper. And what they did here is that they interviewed people who inject drugs and uh, uh, healthcare workers and policymakers that are linked to the delivery of, of HIV and harm reduction services and ask them about what uh, the promise of methadone meant for them, to them. And so this was also an interesting finding because despite the primary focus of their qualitative research being HIV risk and its prevention, a, a striking feature of interview accounts was a strong emphasis uh, that, they, uh, that they gave to self-recovery. So for them, HIV was a very secondary objective of methadone and really what mattered was self-recovery. And I'm gonna read you a few uh, quotes just to highlight this. So for example, if I can stop taking drugs and cease using the injection, then I can lead a good life. I can then live a good life without the injecting and I look at that positive, at life positively. Um, I will reform, I will be back, and again, I will be important in the community. I want to go back, I want to go back to my job and to start my family again. Uh, in terms of community perspective of methadone, um, this comes from one of the stakeholders. Uh, uh, he or she said, the idea is that as soon as people start using this new medicine from outside, these people are going to be okay. They perceive that people will stay away from drugs and they, they and that they won't be people using drugs. So there won't be any problems related to drug use. We give methadone to the people and the problem is over. They come, they take the dose and they don't need to take drugs. They don't need to inject themselves. They don't need to steal. They can go to work. Yeah, that's what we want. And so this explained why methadone was much better accepted than a syringe exchange programs, for example. Um, and so while the national uh, Kenyan policy in keeping with the thrust of global evidence envisages methadone primarily in, re in relation to HIV prevention, so around harm reduction, affected communities, including people who inject drugs, appear to frame methadone primarily in relation to addiction recovery. And so this shows that the social construction of methadone uh, in the present as a hope for addiction recovery is in danger of producing dashed hopes. So um, I thought that this um, conclusion from, from their paper uh, was a good explanation of why combining uh, modeling and qualitative methods was useful. So this collision of framing in relation to expectation of effects also speaks to the different kinds of data generated in mixed method implementation science. So for example, between the data we have generated through the modeling oriented to HIV prevention impact, and that which we have generated through qualitative interviews, which have captured participant perspectives on recovery. So modeling methadone's potential as an HIV prevention solution tends to reproduce predominant policy framings, whereas a qualitative analysis um, uh, looks at alternative framings grounded in local practices. And basically they say that both are needed in terms of um, implementation science when uh, bringing a new technology to a new setting. So now I'll uh, change gears a little bit and I will be um, telling you about my own uh, work uh, trying to integrate qualitative research into modeling. And so I'm gonna start from the very beginning during my PhD uh, when I was characterizing HIV transmission in uh, the Lurigancho prison uh, in Lima. And so, um, this involves uh, firstly uh, modeling incarceration patterns in Lurigancho. And so this is just to show you the, the model diagram. So this was a partial uh, differential equation model. And that means that you can look at um, dynamics over two different dimensions. And in this case, it was both time and time spent uh, in prison. And so you can see that here people, when they entered prison, they enter the first month in prison and they move to the second, third, fourth, fifth months, et cetera, of, of, of their sentence. And then they can come out of prison and uh, start their, their period out of prison and they can come back to prison a second time, come out, be back in prison a third time, et cetera. I'm gonna show you this in a little bit more detail. So when people, for example, came out of prison in the third month, they could either come out forever, so never be incarcerated again, or they could uh, 
come out of prison, spend some time out of prison, and then be back in prison. Um, and so getting data to parameterize this um, uh, was relatively straightforward from the data that I had from the Lurigancho prison. However, understanding the sexual organization in the prison was much more complicated and I had very little information available from uh, their surveys. And so I started looking at um, qualitative information because at that time it was too late for me to obtain ethical approval to actually implement qualitative interviews in the prison. And I found this book, which is about the social construction of the prison reality. And it looked at five prisons in Latin America, including Lurigancho. I looked for this book very intensely and I emailed bookshops and I ended up basically harassing this poor man on all of the email addresses that I could find. And he finally responded to me and he ended up uh, doing a photocopy of his book and sending it to me to London, where I was at the time, through his niece who was doing her um, degree in London. So it sounds like this was 1954 or something. It was actually somewhere around 2009. But uh, I got the book and it was extremely useful because uh, he was an ethnographer who had spent two years living uh, with the inmates in the Lurigancho prison. And so he understood the sexual organization of the prison very well. And this helped me, um, I mean, with, with limitations, of course, but to better disaggregate the population based on their sexual behaviors. And so this is what I did here. So you can see the population of inmates at the bottom and the population of visitors at the bottom. And the very, uh, I guess, the main um, information that I got from this is that sex within the Lurigancho prison was actually not so different from sex outside of the prison because the prison relied so heavily on visitors to bring food and uh, soap and anything that the inmates need that uh, there was very few restrictions in terms of visitors. So although officially you needed to be married or to have some legal bound in order to have a conjugal visits, there was a whole parallel uh, system of conjugal visits that occurred in the prison, including visits of female sex workers who regular, regularly worked in the prison. And so this meant that some men continued only having sex with their wife or uh, partner, um, and some men had uh, casual heterosexual sex, that was the CHS stands for, and so they would have sex with their wives or, or female partners as well as female sex workers. And then there was a group of uh, higher risk that had uh, multiple partners, including men and women. And so they had their stable partner who came for uh, visits, female sex workers. They also had sex with other men in the prison and they had sex with um, transgender women in the prison who generally worked as sex workers. There was also a group that uh, fully abstained from sex during their time in prison. The other thing that I learned from, from uh, his work was that actually um, there is an evolution in sexual behavior through time in prison um, uh, among, among, the, among these inmates. And so people generally move through uh, higher risk behaviors or just stop having sex. And so I, had, I incorporated this progression through different sex uh, behavior groups. So moving from only having sex with your wife to always having uh, also having sex with casual partners to also having sex with men. And so um, I'm not going to present results on this. It was just to kind of show you how this had been useful. And also because it was quite an interesting story uh, in terms of um, when I went back to Peru to uh, present my findings uh, to the Ministry of Health and to the penitentiary system, this man who had written the book um, who actually was previously a priest, had actually become the director of the prison. And he took me again to the prison I had visited a few times, and he took me through all of the prison workshops. And as a thank you for having dedicated my part of my PhD to, to this, he gave me this lamp, which many of you have seen on my desk, and which he said represented um, the caring doctor holding the heart of the inmate. And, it was his, his thank you present to me. I have now gone from feeling a bit terrified about it to consider it a valuable piece of art. Um, so it was a good ending to my qualitative inquiry. So the second study I want to talk to you about is a more recent study that I did informing HIV combination prevention policy among transgender women in Lima, again, um, uh, and so 
This was published in the Lancet Public Health uh, uh, last year, and it was a mixed method study. And so basically what we did was, it was a three part, three component study. The first component was a stakeholder analysis. And the idea was to investigate perceptions of available and novel prevention methods among uh, care providers, policymakers, and members of the MSM transgender women community. Uh, there was a health system capacity analysis. So uh, understand the feasibility of implementing these novel prevention methods uh, within the current infrastructure of HIV prevention delivery in Peru. And then there was a mathematical modeling study, which I was leading, uh, which aimed to estimate the potential impact and cost effectiveness of different intervention packages. And so um, uh, I, I used the stakeholder analysis and the health system capacity analysis to inform the mathematical modeling. And I will tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, so just to kind of ground us on what the objective of the modeling was, it was to look at these different um, uh, interventions in isolation and in combination and uh, estimate uh, the proportion of infections that would be averted over a 10 year period and to identify which combination of packages could prevent 50% of new infections among transgender women and their partners in Lima. This 50% was an Angus goal at the time, so we, we use that as a, as a target. So the stakeholder analysis uh, was useful in terms of selecting the interventions that we would uh, implement in the model. And so we looked at the WHO guidelines for HIV prevention among MSM and transgender women and discussed the interventions recommended in, this, um, in these guidelines with uh, different stakeholders. Uh, to understand acceptability and to understand limitations for their implementation. And so the available interventions were ART, condom use, and the novel interventions were ART, test and offer. Uh, so above 500 CD4, which at the time uh, was still not uh, a guideline, and pre-exposure prophylaxis. And um, so this involved qualitative interviews with healthcare providers, men who have sex with men and transgender women, as well as decision makers. And we also had a discussion at the Peruvian National HIV Prevention Meeting, uh, which was held in November 2014. And I led a workshop uh, that focused on modeling the interventions and on designing these interventions. So understanding what would be needed to implement PrEP, to implement ART, test and offer, uh, in order to inform the modeling. And so this is what I used at the time. Um, so basically, uh, groups uh, were separated and they all discussed these together and then I went with each of the groups and we had a board and we discussed uh, each of each of these potential interventions and so it was the first question was what interventions would be needed to achieve these goals so how can we increase uh, testing coverage because it was uh, very low at the time in Peru and it still is quite low um, and so, for example, here, many mentioned mobile units, uh, that that was the only uh, way to reach transgender women effectively. Um, and, and what would be needed to increase condom use, uh, given that there was condom use fatigue in this population. Um, same for uh, early ART treatment. And so anything that would be needed to actually achieve this was uh, discussed with the group. And this helped me design my intervention, which was especially important in terms of costing because it's not the same to just say, oh, well, testing coverage will increase to say, well, we're gonna need X amount of mobile units and uh, you know, the personnel to uh, you know, make these mobile units work, et cetera. The costs kind of become much, much larger as, as we incorporate these. And then the second question actually directly inform the parameters um, of, of my model. So what would be realistic goals for the coverage increase of these services and for the time required to achieve this? So I, I was basically asking by how much do you think it is realistic to expect that testing coverage will, will increase, that treatment coverage will increase? Uh, by how much do you think increases in condom use are feasible? And um, all of these was discussed and we came to consensus um, uh, to consensus priors, basically. 
And uh, the discussion uh, also led to us investigating two different scenarios. One was a basic scenario that accounted for all of these limitations that were discussed in this meeting. So the fact that low HIV testing rates were a problem in terms of slowing our ART and PrEP scale up. And so we needed to implement an outreach strategy, suboptimal adherence to ART and PrEP among transgender women. So we needed to represent this impact on efficacy of both of these methods. Uh, difficulty in increasing condom use, so we needed to implement a comprehensive interventions beyond just condom distribution. But discussions with the stakeholders also led us to implement an enhanced scenario, which aimed to uh, address uh, these limitations to achieve the UNAIDS 1990-90 targets. And this was important, especially to the policymakers, because they wanted to know what would be needed to actually achieve these targets, uh, as this was their personal, uh, their personal goal. And so we, um, we incorporated into the model different and into the costing all of the elements that were uh, deemed necessary to achieve a better ART uh, impact, for example. So implementing of new information system, linkage and adherence support programs through peer educators, sensitization of healthcare professionals, um, strengthening of drug delivery, etc. cetera. Uh, same for condom use and for PrEP. I'm not gonna go into detail because I see that my time is running. Um, and so this uh, led us to having these two scenarios for each of the interventions. And as you can see, the parameters in terms of effectiveness, coverage, and time to scale up are different uh, for, the, for, the two, for the two scenarios. Um, I don't know why I can't, okay. So, well, I mean, again, I'm not presenting results because the, the goal here is to say how did qualitative research, uh, you know, lead this modeling work in a different direction. And I think uh, it, it's, it, it's two main, the, there's two main ways in which it helped. Firstly, it told us that it was important to have these two scenarios. So showing the real situation and having a basic scenario that acknowledges the problems that are being faced by the HIV prevention program in, in Peru but also uh, the interest in knowing what has to be improved in order to achieve international goals. And the second way in which it helped us was to also have realistic uh, parameters for the intervention impact and what was needed in order to, to achieve this impact. So now I'm gonna tell you about my most recent uh, project, also integrating qualitative research. So this looks at the potential impact of providing ART and opioid agonist therapy in prison and upon release on HIV incidents among people who inject drugs in Tijuana. And so as all you know um, in this group, uh, Tijuana is a major transit route uh, where drugs are trafficked into the United States. There is a large population of people who inject drugs, although this number is actually very uncertain. Um, HIV prevalence is 3.5%. It seems to have increased uh, according to the latest uh, estimates, and HIV is between 1% and 2% uh, per year. Uh, and there is a high exposure to incarceration among this population. We have uh, a huge amount of information on people who inject drugs in, in, in Tijuana through several rounds of El Cuete studies that have been led by Stephanie Stradby. And the latest one was El Cuete 4 that followed um, a cohort of people who inject drugs from 2011 to 2020 and uh, tested them for HIV every six months and asked them uh, about sexual and drug using behaviors, policing, incarceration, and access to harm reduction. And so prisons represent an opportunity for HIV prevention and care as incarceration is frequent and it is a time where uh, inmates can be given their drugs on a daily basis and can get stabilized on those drugs. And so 72% uh, of people who inject drugs in the cohort were ever incarcerated, I mean a 4.5 times since they started injecting. And we also found that recent incarceration was associated with uh, uh, increased receptive serine sharing. So uh, the aim of this study was to use mathematical modeling to estimate the potential impact of providing ART and OAT in prisons and upon release on HIV incidents among this population, and to use qualitative interviews to investigate the acceptability and feasibility of implementing these services in prison. And so, 
uh, I'm not gonna I'm gonna go a little bit quickly through the modeling um, so basically um, well we developed a deterministic model and it was disaggregated by sex incarceration stage and OAT and HIV stage and uh, I carried out 18 uh, interviews with uh, recently incarcerated people who inject drugs these lasted approximately 1.15 hours and uh, I uh, looked at uh, experiences of withdrawal and drug use in prison, exposure to HIV and harm reduction services, acceptability of HIV and harm reduction services in prison, and finally, opinions about the feasibility of implementation of these services. And I used thematic analysis to analyze the data. And so this is just to show you how the prison, uh, uh, how incarceration was represented in the model and how the increased risk of HIV uh, in re uh, for those recently incarcerated uh, was represented and the goal was to look at uh, by how much uh, applying well uh, providing these uh, services in prison could reduce HIV infections among the entire population of people who inject drugs uh, in in Tijuana over uh, the 2012-2030 period sorry that's wrong it should be I think 2020 not going to go through the model parameters, but just to show you that we uh, uh, model the increase in serine sharing in recent incarceration. We incorporated the reduced risk of HIV acquisition among those on OAT and the reduced risk of HIV transmission among those on ART. This is a quite a broad range for uh, injecting drug use because it hasn't been well characterized, but it's believed to be much lower than for heterosexual sex. And so I investigated four main scenarios. Uh, so you can see here the four stages of incarceration, never, in prison, recently incarcerated, and not recently incarcerated. And across these four stages, people can either be off or on OAT and off or on ART. And so the first scenario looked at uh, putting people who are HIV positive on ART when they enter prison. The second scenario looked at pe putting people uh, who inject drugs on OAT when they enter prison. We assume a dropout rate once they come out. Um, and then the third scenario looked at combining these two interventions in prison. And then the fourth scenario looked at uh, implementing a scale up of these two interventions in the community. So this just summarizes that for you again. So the efficacy of ART and OAT on reducing uh, transmission and acquisition respectively, the dropout rate in prison and outside for each of these interventions, the coverage inside and outside, and again, what each co uh, scenario considered. And so these are the results for the modeling. As you can see, uh, Scenario one, so ART in prison and release could lead to one, a reduction in one fifth of new infections over the 2018-2030 period. OAT uh, alone uh, reaches a similar uh, reduction in, in infections. The combination leads to nearly a third, in, a third reduction in, in HIV new infections and also scaling up in the community at achievable levels uh, led to a nearly 50% reduction in HIV incidence across this time period among all people who inject drugs. And so basically the model shows that this could have a huge impact on uh, HIV, on the HIV epidemic among people who inject drugs in Tijuana. And again, I'm not only speaking about those who enter prison, this is the effect that it has on the entire population. So then uh, looking at the uh, preliminary results for the interviews as I'm still analyzing these, uh, we found that drug use uh, and withdrawal, uh, that drugs are intermittently available in prison, but at a very high price and in men's prison and not available in women's prisons, that people who inject drugs who enter prison suffer from really serious and prolonged withdrawal symptoms upon entry. Uh, in terms of HIV services and drug treatment, some receive tranquilizers to appease them, but this is only if it's on a weekday and if uh, it's on the physician's discretion, so not all are that lucky. And uh, HIV, happens, HIV testing happens inconsistently. And I'm going to go straight into the acceptability of services. So there was a high acceptance of HIV testing and treatment in prison, but there was much reluctance to use OAT. And this surprised me because I expected that there would be reluctance to get tested for HIV in the prison because uh, those who are HIV positive get moved to a different uh, place of the prison uh, and are, are segregated basically. And I thought that given the like 
experience of withdrawal in prison, everybody would want to receive OAT when entering prison. And this was not the case. And the main reasons for this were that methadone was considered too strong a drug and, and often was mentioned to be a deadly drug. And so I've put the quotes in Spanish in gray uh, for those who speak Spanish, and uh, I'm gonna read a few of the ones in English. So for example, that one methadone is stronger than this one, heroin. With methadone, you can even die. You can even end up in hospital and die. It's a substance that's too strong for the human body. My mom, rest in peace, died from methadone. It fucks up your organs. All of them, it fucks up. Then methadone as another addictive substance. So you, could, you get hooked to both drugs. You can become addicted to it and using heroin and then also methadone, that would be too much for the body, right? So they saw it as I'm becoming addicted to an additional substance. I don't need that. Uh, and then it's like heroin. It becomes medicine for us and we need it to live. And so this was particularly interesting because it is a medicine and for them that didn't seem to be something positive. For them, heroin becomes a medicine as well. So what's the difference between methadone and heroin basically? Um, also, there was a lot of prejudice against use of methadone in the wrong way. So many of them said, yes, give, because when I asked them the question, they were like consultants. And so they were like, what do you, do you think it would be a good idea to implement methadone in prison? And so they would be like, uh, yes, but only give it to those who really want to change. And so it was like, yes, it works, it works. But again, we come back to whether you really mean to quit. If not, what for? Out of 10 people, one is really trying. The, the others only do it to get the drug. And so this was seeing others uh, in a negative, under a negative light because they weren't truly meaning to, to recover. I'm nearly done. I know we're running out of time, but um, also methadone was seen as only to soothe withdrawal symptoms. So yes, it's fine, but just use it for a very short term. And I had several protocols of how to use it that are very, very detailed and, and very interesting. But this is a short one that basically said, if you use methadone as you should, you can have three administrations. And for those three, you have 10 days. And in those 10 days, you must take three administrations. Do you understand? And so for, for this participant, it was a 10 day treatment it took three, um, three doses and he explained exactly how I should be taking, well, we should, anybody, anybody sorry, should be taking those, those doses. And it was very um, uh, uh, specific and, and he explained the effect in the body, etc. All vice that is free to prevent withdrawal, bring it on. Because the truth is they would abuse it. It's fine if you do it progressively, start with a high dose and then small for a detox. But many would say, I'm sick, give me methadone. And it will give it to him even if he doesn't need it. So there was a lot of reluctance in that sense. And finally, I have several quotes for this, but uh, there is very much this idea that quitting heroin is about willpower. Uh, I know that with the pills, there would be no problem. I've always uh, thought that if I need to quit, I can take Rivotril, Rivotril, sorry, and with that, I'm about to quit. So th this idea that it's easy to quit if you really want to. So I split this uh, in values, attitudes, and beliefs, which is one of, um, one of the ways uh, to, code, um, uh, to code qualitative interviews. And basically, uh, this summarizes why I think uh, there is a need to change, um, to change the perspective of methadone before such a program can be implemented. So the values that came up very frequently in this interview is the importance of being clean and fully sober and that uh, quitting is based on courage and bravery and also this idea of religion and salvation and the fact that um, prison, and that comes later on in the beliefs, but uh, several saw prison as a message from God to quit heroin. They were in a really, really bad period of their lives and on the edge and suddenly they end up in prison and they, they see that as God saving them from, from death and, and giving them another opportunity to, to start a new life. And as I described earlier on, methadone is just for detox. Methadone is highly addictive. Methadone can make you sick, kill you, uh, and quitting heroin is a matter of willpower. And in terms of attitude, attitude, sorry, many felt that people would just take methadone to get free drugs, that it would be used uh, as a good, become corrupted. And um, also I didn't go into this, but uh, 
one of the main assumptions of the model is that people continue on ART or on methadone after they are released from prison. And this seemed a very difficult thing to achieve because uh, once they come out, first they are released mostly at three in the morning uh, and they have no money and uh, you know it's, it's quite a desperate situation and the first thing they generally do is, is to use drugs. And there's also this feeling of having recovered your freedom. So the first thing you do is, is, is use drugs. So in terms of conclusions, prisons could provide a valuable opportunity for initiating people on uh, uh, people who inject drugs on HIV and drug treat on ART, sorry, and drug treatment in Tijuana. Uh, nearly a third of new infections could be prevented between 2018 and 2030 through this. Um, and um, a substantial scale up in the community could uh, bump this up to 50%. There is high acceptability of HIV services in prison. However, it could be due to study biases because our population is very used to getting HIV tests and is very well aware of HIV uh, uh, prevention and, and they might also have wanted to show that. Um, and as I said, there is a need to reshape perceptions of methadone and of recovery from the drug use uh, and to provide solid information on OAT to people who inject drugs and to also improve OAT delivery in private OAT clinics in Tijuana to ensure acceptability and effectiveness. So it's not as easy as the model shows. And so all of this is taking us towards a mathematical modeling and qualitative research integration framework. I'm not gonna go through these in detail because I've run out of time, but basically I argue that this can be done in a much more systematic way and um, that uh, qualitative uh, research can inform the modeling process at each stage, uh, as I have described uh, previously, and that it would follow uh, mixed methods, establish mi mixed methods processes, um, such as um, yeah, explanatory sequential analysis, convergent parallel analysis, etc. I'm not getting into that, but a system, for a systematic integration, uh, we would need to conceptualize uh, these from the study design stage. Uh, the purpose of integration should be defined at the start. The questions to be answered by each method should be, by each method, sorry, should be predetermined. And we should also allow for an iterative feedback between the two, two methods. So for example, here with what I showed in terms of incarceration uh, as an opportunity to, to increase access to, to these treatments, uh, I could go back and change my modeling assumptions to take into account what I've learned from the qualitative interviews. And so overall, um, I think integration of these methods can improve model representation of key mechanisms of transmission and health outcomes, improve the accuracy of model findings and improve communication of findings through better contextualization. And thank you for listening. Sorry, I went slightly over time. Uh, I'd like to thank my funders, all of my co-authors and collaborators, as well as the study and focus group participants. And that's it for me. I don't know, I assume we might not have time for questions. Okay, I see actually one question in the chat. It says, is it safe to say that one main contribution of quantitative research is to help define and parameterize compartments in compartmental models? So basically to whether qualitative research can be used to inform the the disaggregation of the population in the model. So which, which compartments should be represented in the model? Yes. Uh, I think that's one of the contributions uh, that qualitative research can have in the field of modeling. So better knowing who uh, in the population we should uh, explicitly represent. And also in terms of informing parameters, um, yes, whether you know, the, these certain parameters should, should have higher prior values or lower prior values. I didn't get into those details, but uh, that, that's a very specific uh, way in which qualitative uh, data could inform the, the model parameterization. This is Natasha. I was wondering if I could make a quick comment slash ask a question. Anik, I really loved your talk. And what I loved about it was that, you know, as a modeler, you know, although we are always thinking about incorporating both qualitative and quantitative data, 
Um, I like the idea of really trying to place it together. And I liked how you mentioned the Tanzania paper that kind of presented both the qualitative findings and implications of methadone in Tanzania, as well as the modeling side by side. And I was wondering if you could talk about um, whether you think that that increases political buy-in or sort of like engagement in reading and interpreting the results to have it explicitly sort of paired within a document instead of some of these thoughts as like footnotes in the discussion. And whether you had um, any insight to that for your Peru work in terms of that sort of parity engagement and translation to policymakers. Thank you, Natasha. I think that's a really interesting question because uh, yes, I think that even though that might not have been the first intention of that qualitative study, the fact that, that they involved uh, decision makers in the qualitative interviews uh, is is an immediate way of engaging them in the research and of uh, like making them look at the findings of modeling in in a more uh, you know like uh, careful way and and take into considerations what it means so I think it puts modeling modeling has often been um, perceived as uh, something somehow superior uh here here this is what's going to happen in the future if you do this and that and i think it just puts it at a, a more uh, it levels it to other uh considerations that are so important when when making policy decisions and i mean it's it's well known actually that there is a big gap between what's uh, recommended uh, by models and what actually happens just because so many other considerations uh take a more important, uh, yeah, are, are more important when, when, when making policy decisions. So as you say, I think having these two things, these two methods uh, used in parallel might actually improve how modeling findings are incorporated into policy making. Yeah, I think so. And I think especially in this COVID era where people are seeing a lot of modeling, they're seeing a lot of models that are wrong. And there's this, you know, inevitable backlash and skepticism in terms of what models can say and uncertainty that kind of having that added contextualization and, and stakeholder input can help with that validity process a little bit. But anyway, thanks for your talk. That was great. Thank you. Any more questions? There's no beer. <laughs> I know, there's no fun. I don't know. Okay, thank you, Anit. No, thank you for, for listening. I know I, I rushed, I always put too many things in my presentations and then I'm out of breath by the end of it, but someday I'll learn. I doubt it, <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.